So it's my pleasure to um, moderate the last session, uh, which is entitled Microbial Solutions to Modern Challenges in Food Systems and Metabolic Health. And this session was put together thinking about what kinds of insights and uh, challenges as well as opportunities arise from using microbiome associated tools and things like the environment and our understanding of, of human health. And to start off with, uh, we have a, a professor of anesthesiology here from Duke, Paul Wishmeyer, who will get started. As you may note from my title on the screen, I'm an anesthesiologist by training. And so you may wonder what the heck is an anesthesiologist doing talking to you about nutrition and the microbiome. So maybe we should start there. And, and, and maybe we should start with something that, that I think will affect all of our lives, no matter what walk of life we come from. How many of you in this room have had surgery before? Raise your hands. Um, if you didn't raise your hands, you will. This is data from Atul Gawande, show that every US citizen will have 9.2 operations in their lifetime. Um, some of these are cosmetic procedures, but they're still surgeries nonetheless. But as I think the key here is as our population ages more and more, we are going to have many more patients coming to operations. We have the mortality from heart disease, and so things like cancer and other GI disorders and infections are showing up in our operating rooms and the ICUs that I work in. I'm primarily an ICU physician and a nutrition physician. And I think the key point that I, the first key point I want to get across is, is that if my career is to be a success, this will need to be true, that someday no malnourished patient will ever have elective surgery without nutritional and perhaps microbiome assessment and optimization. And what does that look like when patients do have surgery, because it happens every day? And, and what happens when we operate on people who really aren't ready? And it, Describe that, I want to tell you about a patient I took care of. I moved to Duke about three years ago to actually work on nutrition programs I'll talk about. But I used to work at University of Colorado years past. And this was a patient I took care of in Colorado. And his name was Joshua. And he was a 23-year-old male who had Crohn's disease. And he was presenting for a partial colectomy. He was going to have a portion of his infant large intestine removed. And he was having surgery in a small hospital in the mountains. Um, in Colorado, and you can see his BMI was quite low. He'd lost a significant amount of weight, which is common inflammatory bowel disease, and he was scheduled for surgery two days from now. And so the question is, is he ready for surgery? It wasn't emergent, it was truly elective, um, and, and should we maybe have waited and tried to optimize his nutrition and perhaps his microbiome? Well, that didn't happen, of course. It still rarely happens today, and he went to surgery. And he did well for the first two days after surgery, but the third day, unfortunately, he developed a cough, and he got a fever. It was diagnosed with pneumonia. It's a common post-operative complication. Unfortunately for Joshua, this progressed to something much more severe. Not hours later, he developed septic shock and went into what we call disseminated intervascular coagulation. His coagulation system failed. He started to bleed, and he got a major blood clot in his abdomen. And so the Physicians at the small hospital in Mountains didn't feel they could care for Joshua anymore, and they flew him down to us at the university to care for him. And we took Joshua to the operating room and worked through the clot and, and stopped the bleeding and, and dealt with the issues that he was having. And he came back to me in the ICU looking, unfortunately, like this, with his abdomen open and his lungs quite injured on a ventilator, um, which unfortunately is due to the shock and, and, the, and the, the bleeding and the other things he was going through. And Joshua went through a lot of the things our ICU patients, I'm actually attending in the ICU this week, and I was lucky enough to have someone cover for me today. Um, and so this is what I see every day, and our patients go through other things. Clostridium difficile is a real problem now. When I was a resident not so many years ago, I saw one case of this a year, and nobody got very sick from it. Now it's one of the, if not the fastest growing iatrogenic cause of death in the country, not at least in the industrialized world. And he got this, unfortunately, in his remnant colon. It's due to over aggressive antibiotic use and, and the reality of what aggressive bacteria can do. And he also, unfortunately, got this not just before surgery, but after as well. So he never had a nutrition assessment. Nobody ever asked him simple questions like, have you lost weight? And is there something we can do about it? It takes an act of God to start two feedings in the ICU in our hospitals in the US and the nurse going to lunch to stop them. And so he got fed very poorly throughout his care with us. Um, they waited for these magical bowel sounds, which you know mean nothing, for those of you who don't practice clinically, that something that we worry a lot about that we shouldn't. And unfortunately, his stomach didn't work when we fed him because we waited too long. It's not the surgeon's fault, and he vomited, and he was off even longer, and so he got fed very poorly. He lost a lot of muscle mass and was not able to be weaned from the ventilator and had to have a tracheostomy. Remember, he's only 23. Luckily, 48 days later, despite all these things, 
Joshua was discharged, not to home. Our ICU patients that stay like this kind of length, more than a week or two, don't go home. They go to rehab centers. And we as a physicians applaud ourselves. We, we saved him, and I suppose that's a, a good thing, but was he a success? So I asked Joshua the day he left the ICU what he thought about his life, and he said, I'm glad I'm leaving the ICU, but a few concerns I have are one is I can't feed myself or swallow. I have to learn how to swallow again because my muscles are too weak. He couldn't stand, walk, or dress himself. He was too weak to get out of the bed. None of these were his number one complaint. This was. He couldn't change the remote control on the television in the room because his hands were too weak. And so he goes to rehabilitation, and his dad calls me a month later, and I was happy to hear from him. And he tells me Joshua was walking in the hallway trying to get strong again, doing his exercises in rehab, when suddenly he had gripping chest pain and a feeling of doom came upon him. Moments later, this 23-year-old was found in cardiac arrest on the floor of the rehab center. He got 40 minutes of CPR. And moments later, he was declared dead. What did he die of? Anyone who spent time in a surgical ward will know he got a clot, blood clots from immobility, and he got a massive pulmonary embolus. But what happened to him? He should have lived, right? He was young. We, we treated all of his illnesses, per se. We got him out of the hospital. What did he really die of? He died of this. He died of malnutrition and dysbiosis. And this happened right under my nose, and I'll never forget him. And so his nutrition and his microbiome were neglected and were truly emergencies in this patient. And so we, as caregivers and scientists, need to find better ways, and we need to do better in how we care for patients. And I guess the real question as we think about that is how common is this? Is Joshua just a story I'm pulling your heartstrings with or is this common? The reality is it's common. No matter where you are in the world, one out of three, if not half of the patients in any hospital, anywhere on any ward are malnourished when they come to the hospital. And they don't get better nourished when they're with us. The food isn't that good. This is HCUP data, which is a large database the government keeps that we can mine for information. And we know that when you actually clinically diagnose people meaningfully, one out of three people on average is malnourished in the hospitals in the US. Only 3% are ever coded or diagnosed in actual practice. So only one in 10 malnourished patients are being recognized. More troubling, of those patients diagnosed with malnutrition, only one in 10 of those actually ever get any meaningful nutrition treatment. And so one in 100 malnourished hospitalized patients are being addressed for their malnutrition. We would advocate it's the most pressing silent epidemic we face in the hospital today because it's not being recognized and it's definitely not being treated. GI surgery like Joshua is even worse. Two out of three patients coming for any GI surgery are severely malnourished and at risk. Is it related to outcome? We know that it is. GI cancer surgeries are rapidly going operation we see a lot of here at Duke and other places. If you haven't lost weight before you have an oncology surgery, your mortality is very low. If you have lost weight, you're five times more likely to die in that operation. This is an infographic we made with DCRI for a guidelines paper I was honored to chair the group for. And again, two out of three people coming for GI surgery are malnourished and increases your risk of complications and death significantly. But only one in five hospitals, and this is a survey I did with a medical student, we surveyed all the academic surgery programs in the US, only one in five of a formal nutrition screening program of any kind. Although all the surgeons you ask will say it, it would help patients if we address their malnutrition, they would have better outcomes. The data's clear. In fact, those little boost and insure drinks that you can buy, every dollar the hospital spends on those, we showed in over a million patients in a health outcomes database, saves $52 in hospital costs. There is no more cost effective. This is better than influenza vaccine, to give you some sense of the outcome and safety. But only one in five malnourished surgery patients ever see any nutrition intervention at all. And I think. The reason it's so ignored is this. The mortality that relates to malnutrition in a hospitalized patient doesn't happen in the hospital. We're good at saving people, keeping their hearts going and their lungs moving, but they die months later at a much greater rate. Joshua got out of the hospital, but only lived a month. So we need to be better, but how do we do that? And, and can we change this? And we believe we can. We believe that we must train patients for surgery or as Tony's doing, perhaps a bone marrow transplant, sitting in the back for the marathon of their lives, because that's what bone marrow transplant or surgery really is for these patients. We call it the marathon du table, because that's the reality. And of course, it takes a combination of good nutrition, 
exercise and perhaps some of the things we can learn from athletes, which is really where a lot of my research besides microbiome work goes and how we can apply athletic um, nutrition and exercise principles to the training surgery or cancer patient. And then obviously optimizing the microbiome and assessing it. So at Duke, we've tried to address this. It's one of the, one of the big reasons I came to Duke was the opportunity to do this. And we have a preoperative nutrition clinic that could have taken a patient like Joshua and probably changed his outcome. We phone screen all 60,000 people having surgery with some basic nutrition questions now. It just started about a year ago. And they come to our clinic. We have an RD now dedicated to this the hospital pays for. Tony's doing this in his BMT patients as well. And then we have a continuity of care service that screens them with a screening tool we built, brings them to a clinic with a dietitian. They're followed by our inpatient dietitian team. And then we have a post-op follow-up program as well. And we assess a whole range of things, not just nutrition. We do muscle and fitness assessments, microbiome assessments, before and after surgery. And we've developed scores. And in fact, we even see pet test our patients like an athlete would be tested to perform at his best. This is a score we built. If you're having surgery, these are questions you should ask yourself or the person you love or your grandmother or friend. Um, nobody should have surgery without these questions being answered. If any answer is yes, you have no business having elective surgery without being nutritionally optimized. Nutritional optimization looks like this. These are pathways we built for our clinic. Um, and in fact, these aren't very specific objective questions, so we're trying to find objective tools to do that. Ultrasound fixes everything else in the hospital. We're finding it actually addresses malnutrition as well. We have muscle-specific ultrasounds that can take the muscle, biopsy it in a way, and make it look like this. It measures muscle mass, muscle glycogen, and muscle quality, all within minutes at the bedside. And again, we exercise test patients in a study we're doing now. We hope it becomes standard of care. And then we prescribe HIT training to the elderly folks having surgery, believe it or not. And they come back, and we're running patients through this program now. Um, this is John Whittle and Jerome, two of my collaborators who really are the ones committed to this. And we have some foundation funding to do it. And then our ability to measure caloric needs have improved. This is the first new generation metabolic heart in the US. We have the only one here at Duke in the country. Sets up and runs in 10 minutes and calibrates itself in five. Anyone can use it. It weighs 10 pounds. It's a large cry for those of you in the nutrition world who have seen the very difficult to use metabolic carts that weren't accurate and didn't really work. But we're here to talk about the microbiome as well, so let me focus a bit on that for, for the key part of that portion. And so again, I think this is a key part of our optimization of patients, both in their preparation and recovery. And this is what I always tell my patients, it's bacteria or something you're taught to eradicate and get rid of, right? We spend lots of time on rounds talking about our antibiotic choices to kill off all the bugs in your body. The reality is the majority of them probably 100 trillion of them are the best friends you could ever have. And you wouldn't want to get rid of them. Perhaps you'd want to put them back. right? And we're starting to do that. We're starting to prescribe stool. There's books about how you can take it yourself at home. The kids at MIT will sell you poop pills that they claim will make you smarter. The FDA has some thoughts about that. But nonetheless, it is happening. And it, and it is saving lives. right? This is a patient you might have heard of. She got a lot of national attention. Her name was Caitlin. She was in a car accident in Atlanta. She's 20 years old. She was in the hospital a month about to go home when she got C. diff. It was very severe. She went multiple rounds of antibiotics. She was about to die from it. She got a stool transplant from her mom. Within two days, she was better and it never recurred again. So it's saving lives already. And this is the hypothesis that we, at least in my work in the ICU, have been working on, that antibiotics and surgery and illness ablate or dysbiose the microbiome in our patients, both in the mouth and the gut. And perhaps we should give it back. We should be resodding the lawn that's blighted by illness. Because the reality is it's important to remember that the world we live in is not a human world, but a microbial world. Only those few little families that are in red are actually multicellular organisms. Most of the life on Earth is bacterial. And so why should you care about your microbes? For the nutrition people in the room who don't think about the microbiome want that much, or maybe haven't read about it much before. Have you ever wondered why you get bit by all the mosquitoes in the woods and your wife, husband, friends don't? It's not because you're sweeter. It's the bacteria that live on your skin that drive that. Bacteria attract or repel mosquitoes with the substances they make. In fact, we may find out someday that the microbes actually determine who we have sex with and marry. We know that's true in fruit flies, at least for now. Perhaps in humans, too. We know the gut microbiota, the fruit fly, determines its mating preferences. And so the microbiome plays a pretty big role in your lives and potentially your health. And that's the question we want to address. So where do our microbes come from first? I think this is important. Right? If you have a pet at home, your microbiome looks different than it does if you don't have a pet at home. But of course, our microbes begin at birth. Right? They come from our moms. And for thousands of years, we were all born by vaginal delivery. 
And so we acquired a stool, oral, and whole body microbiome that looked like mom's vaginal flora. That's what we're supposed to tolerate our immune system to. Unfortunately, of course, nowadays, sometimes you have to be born by C-section. Babies born by C-section for the first two years of life will resemble mom's skin flora. Babies born by C-sections have more asthma, more allergy, linked to all kinds of other issues, obesity. Rob Knight, who was the partner I worked with in Colorado that got me into the microbiome, when his child was born by C-section, he kicked everybody out of the delivery room and smeared mom's vaginal secretions all over the baby. It's probably the most important thing I'll tell you today and the only thing you'll remember, but you should do that if that happens to you, and his child's never had an ear infection. So there you go. And it's also diet, right? There's a lot of things in the Western world that have changed a great deal from what our microbiome looked like when we were hunter-gatherers, and we had a much more primitive diet and didn't take antibiotics as children. And although eradicating infectious disease has been a great success of modern medicine, that has been met with an incredible rise in autoimmune disease at the same time. We are not tolerizing the things we should be tolerizing to. We are too clean. We don't let our children eat enough dirt. Hence why we have more autoimmune disease, like the IBD that led to Joshua's surgery. Our brains are affected too. We know that the microbiota affect our brains and our brains affect our microbiome. Stressors in modern life are perhaps different than they used to be, perhaps much more dramatic than they previously were, and have a great effect on our microbiome. So again, the brain talks to the gut and the gut talks to the brain. I'll show you later the microbiome make neurotransmitters which affect the brain and our stress affects our gut. And so do changes matter? Well, we know when children get antibiotics, they do. In the first six months of life, if you get antibiotics, you're much more likely to be obese, have allergies, have heart disease, lots of illnesses can be tied to that. And so the question then becomes, can we fix it? Can we change the microbiome to prevent or treat a disease? Well, we've started to do that already with fecal transplants. But that really is the question. When we become ill, especially critically ill like Joshua was, numerous things change how our bacteria respond to us. Just getting an opiate actually makes your bacteria more aggressive. It senses your stress. Vasopressors, antibiotics, low FOS levels, lack of nutrition, all to make your bacteria more aggressive, as well as the psychological stress of illness. So the idea might be that we need to restore balance to our patients and resod the lawn that they need. And the literature of probiotics is growing rapidly. I need to update this curve. It's even much greater than it was before. There are many of our foods probably useful to know if they're beneficial to us or not, and there's plenty of books about them as well. And so what's the science behind them? And I was lucky enough to train in a gentleman named Eugene Chang in John Alverdi's lab at the University of Chicago, where while I was there actually, John Alverdi discovered quorum sensing. It's the idea that all of us have pathogens living in our colons, all of you have this right now, pseudomonas and other things, that sit quietly waiting for you to get stressed, and then they sense your stress and attack, and they express toxins and virulence factors, and some of that's because they lose the commensal flora. So like a hurricane in New Orleans, when all the people leave because of the hurricane, the looters come and start looting, they bring their rowdy friends. That's what bacteria do when all the normal bacteria are killed off by antibiotics. And then if you put them back, perhaps the rowdy friends go away. And that's the idea of restoring balance to the gut and working with the quorum sensing. What's the clinical data for this? Well, we know that probiotics in large meta-analyses in JAMA can reduce antibiotic-associated diarrhea, and it doesn't seem to matter which one you get, which shows you the pathogens are not stronger than the people that live in the city. They're much more likely to leave when the good people come back. And this is a large effect, 40% reduction in antibiotic-associated diarrhea if you take a probiotic. Works in venereal associated pneumonia. Patients without venereal associated pneumonia, this was actually a friend of mine's K grant um, from the NIH. We're given lactobacillus GG, one in the smear of the mouth, one in the stomach. Reduce venereal associated pneumonia by half in an NIH-funded trial. Reduce C. diff as well. Some meta-analysis data my group did, looking at all the trials in the ICU, we found significant reductions in infections, now a large number of patients. One of the challenges is all these studies use different probiotics at different doses and in different patients. And so our data is still pretty heterogeneous. And we have data for this in surgery, we have data for this in trauma. There's a growing body of data for this benefit. But we never had the definitive trial until this one. This may be a trial some of you are familiar with, Nature paper looking at pro and prebiotics given to thousands of children in India infants looking at infection and other infectious complications in Indian infants across the continent of India. 4,000 healthy infants randomized, monitored for 60 days. And you can see the symbiotic, the prebiotic, probiotic combination markedly reduced respiratory infections and sepsis in these infants. Got five pages in nature, not nature this or nature that, but the nature. It was a compelling trial. Significant reductions in the primary outcome that were quite dramatic. 
So we, we realize now this is possible, A, and beneficial, B, and we need to do this now in acutely ill patients, perhaps we can get the same kinds of outcomes. This is started in C. diff, Clostridium difficile actually, as well as responding to fecal transplants, seems to respond to prescriptions of probiotics as well. And randomized trials have been meta-analyzed for this, reduces C. diff 64%, giving a probiotic. We have it on formula here at Duke, we do give it. Um, it works in adults and children. There's lower and higher doses that work. It doesn't seem to matter the bug you give, the probiotic you give. Again, C. diff is a weak organism. Anything that's commensal that surrounds it will make it go away. Um, it, it's, it grows in the absence of others. And so, again, stool transplants are highly effective. They have a very high cure rate, although they have a 5% autoimmunity recurrence rate or autoimmunity occurrence rate, so they have some risks. They're not perfect yet. But they do seem to be able to restore balance. So where do we go from here? We thought large clinical trials or probiotics would be the way to go, or perhaps stool transplants or poop pills. We went to the NIH with a proposal for this, DDDK, and they said, no, maybe not so much. They said the idea that one probiotic might treat all ICU patients, one size fits all, probably wasn't going to work. And they wanted us to tell them actually what was in the microbiome of the critically ill patient before we proposed a trial and then replace it. So they said, tell us what should be in the poop pills, and that would be a much more targeted, meaningful trial. So we did that. We proposed the ICU microbiome project, working with Rob Knight's lab. Um, he's now at UCSD, he was in Colorado, and this was our first publication from that. We, our first set of data, we looked at 115 patients in four centers across North America. All of them were on the vent more than two days. You can't be in the ICU in the North American continent without getting antibiotics for more than 48 hours. You couldn't find any patients who didn't get them. Our hypothesis was a healthy gut is a diverse gut, and the loss of diversity is what leads to bad outcomes or poor outcomes. And we thought we would see that, and we did. Our control group was the American Gut Project. Those of you in the microbiome world will be familiar with that. We had 1,200 matched healthy controls to our patients. You can see the blue patients. This is a, a, a microbiome plot. Um, and you can see there's a massive difference in the blue ICU patients from the red healthy control patients. And actually, we were able to look at specific species that were lost. So you can see now this is the same plot looking at one family of bacteria, and you can see that family is almost entirely lost there in the white, white being a complete lack of abundance of that bacterial family taxa, and then the red being incredible abundance in the healthy individual. This happens in 24 to 48 hours in the RICUs. And so you can see a, a considerable difference. The other thing that was disturbing is this is the um, human uh, microbiome project plotted in the little dots, and the ICU patients plotted on top of them. These are the fecal, oral, and skin samples. You can see that the mouth, the gut, the stool, and the skin begin to look exactly alike um, in ICU patients as we lose barrier function and we lose diversity. So the diversity loss is quite dramatic. Another way to plot the data, you can see the admission and discharge samples have incredible amounts of pathogens or proteobacteria there in red as above versus the healthy subset on the lower graph. And so marked increase in the largely pathogen-derived proteobacteria. Specific Populations and targets did emerge. Fecalibacterium prisnutsii, which makes short fatty, short chain fatty acids that protect the gut, are lost in huge amounts in IBD as well, as it turns out, and are actually a major target for us that we're studying now. And then there are clear pathogens that enrich into the stool of sick patients as well, and you can see that plotted here. Lots of pathogens enriching in the stool of an ICU patient, lots of loss of normal healthy flora. In fact, we found that at ICU admission, the most abundant organism in the gut makes up about 25% of the stool content, of microbiome content of the stool. At ICU discharge, one organism can make up 95% of the gut with complete collapse of diversity within the gut, and one organism dominating is often Enterococcus or Acinetobacter is what we found. So we saw a crash of microbiome diversity. And what about diversity of these patients? You can see it plotted better here. This is the diversity curve in a healthy individual. This is what happens at ICU admission and ICU discharge in the green bars below. So there's massive loss of diversity in these patients very rapidly. And in fact, if you plot those, the ICU patients in red, the healthy in black, if you were a hunter-gatherer, your curve would look like this, by the way. The American diet is by no means healthy. Um, you can see the loss in diversity when we become ill. We did some metabolomic data on this with the Dorenstein lab at UCSD after Rob went to UCSD. Metabolome, as you can imagine, fecal metabolome now in the ICU patient is dramatically different. We had two different preservative solutions that showed us two different, you can see the uh, control group had two different sets, and so we're still working through the methods. But things like Apache score and acute illness scores showed dramatic differences in the fecal metabolome. The sicker you were, the higher your Apache score is. It's a acute illness score. The much more different your metabolome was. We found some interesting targets there, too. We could see all these things, of course, in the fecal 
stool metabolome. We also saw this Pseudomonas quinolone signal. It's an inherently made bacterial protein. It's an antibiotic protein bacteria make to kill other, other bacteria. Um, it's not been described much in humans until very recently, um, but we saw it in a fair number of patients and found it correlated fairly well with the patients that got bacteremic, got C. diff, or got either um, within the hard outcomes we were measuring. And so we, we think this may be a target that we could use to look at high-risk patients and predict who they are. So our results, some of them, as it turns out, one of the biggest correlations to death was large amounts of Klebsiella growing on your skin, which I can't explain, but we found it interesting. Um, bacteremia, loss of barrier function, we think this is part of it. Mycoplasma growing in your mouth seems to go up in large amounts. The question then came, is it the antibiotics or is it the actual illness itself causing it, which is the driver of the loss of diversity and the microbiome changes? So we created an antibiotic pressure score from a Lancet publication a few years ago. We found the oral samples are related to antibiotic use. So your oral microbiome changes seem to relate to antibiotics. Fecal was not. So the gut seems to change in relation to the stress as well as probably the antibiotics. And so the dysbiosis is more than just that. But it did generate targets. Many of the things that are targets in IBD are targets in the ICU we discovered. And so we found the magnitude of diversity seemed to correlate to mortality. And we're still analyzing data. We have a huge data set. If anyone's interested in tapping into this data, we would love more analysis to come out of it. So as I finish, we're doing some other projects. Um, we just finished a collection on Mount Everest with a group from England who collected samples from Sherpas and climbers all the way up nearly to the peak, not quite. So we have stool and oral samples up and down Everest. Look at hypoxia, effects on hypoxia. Um, the Extreme Everest Expedition, they collect all kinds of physiologic data. The 1,000 Patient Project's ongoing here at Duke. Alan Kirk has invested millions of dollars of his own money to collect 1,000 patients worth of omics samples. A lot of people in this room are involved in this project. We're a few hundred patients in, and we have microbiome samples across the spectrum of different surgical illness. And the last piece I'll talk about is we've begun to look at the effect of the microbiome changes on depression, anxiety, and cognition. We know that actually not just probiotics, perhaps psychobiotics exist. They make neurotransmitters and affect how our brains work. Our gut has a big effect on our brain. And in fact, all the neurotransmitters that show up in the brain actually are made by bacteria in the gut as well, and so they can affect how our brain functions. We know that diet has an effect on mood and on depression. Um, a non-Western diet is much more associated with people who do not have mood disorders versus those who eat a poor Western diet who have many more mood disorders. We think some of that is due to microbiome-related changes. There are probiotic meta-analyses showing reductions of depression, and in fact, so this has been studied, and I'm working with Nicola Toronto, who's here at Duke, who's a cognitive translational scientist. We have an R03 to study children's stool samples looking for neuro protective factors, juvenile protective factors, and we're comparing elderly cognitive disordered or cognitively impaired people with their caregivers that live at home with them, and we're matching them up. And so, so in closing, what have we learned so far? A healthy gut is a diverse gut. Loss of diversity appears to associate poor outcomes, and we need to perhaps correct this. And so we hope someday we can change this microbial world we live in, both in our bodies and in the world, by giving back bacteria, perhaps prescribing stool to people. And resod the lawn that's been blighted by illness and put back the 100 trillion friends we didn't know we had and restore balance and hopefully make it so easy a child can actually do it and understand it. It's a big step. Last thing I want to tell you is you may again wonder, as I asked you before, why does an anesthesiologist care so much about nutrition in the microbiome? It's a very strange thing. I'm, I'm the only person I know in my specialty actually doing this right now, which is a nice niche. So why do I care so much and why do I hope you care a lot about it too? Well, the reality is I told you someday you'll have surgery, or someone you love will have surgery. You'll also end up in the ICU. Every American's going to have 1.8 ICU visits in their life, our data would say, as we age. And so someday this will be someone you care about or yourself. Unfortunately for me, I've used up a lifetime of some of your surgeries and ICU visits. This was me at age 15. That picture I use isn't actually Joshua. It's actually me. This is why Joshua means so much. I had IBD as a 15-year-old, was in the hospital a year, on TPN for six months, got 40 units of blood in two weeks, my colon perforated. I ended up with short bowel syndrome, 23 surgeries later. So this is an everyday part of my life, which is why I care so much about it. Not just a few years ago, I ended up in my own ED in my own ICU with val ischemia in, in the operating room. This was actually me in my own emergency room. Went from looking like this, visiting my grandfather a month before my surgery, to looking like this 17 days later. I dropped 20 kilos in 17 days on TPN. No one's immune from this, no matter how fit you are. Which is why nutrition is so key. I couldn't walk down the hallway. After the two weeks, I was so weak. So this is a very personal issue for me, because I tell my residents 
I'll be in the OR again and somebody that 2 a.m. phone call, the guy with the bad abdomen they don't want to see, yeah, that might be me. Or someday that might be you or someone you care about. And that's why I hope this is something we can all care about. And realize no patient should have elective surgery without having these things addressed, their nutrition, their fitness, their microbiome. And that surgery and create a unique opportunity, right? When people come for VMT or they come for a big operation, this is the marathon of their lives. And it's a chance where they'll stop smoking, address their diabetes, change their diet, exercise more, and perhaps permanently change their lives. We have clinics that address all these things. It's the teachable moment in one's life that we feel we have an obligation to do preventive medicine in. So again, I feel we have to train patients and optimize them like we would an athlete for the marathon of the table. And of course, this behavioral change has to start with us. So I dream of a day when all our patients will have a chance to be the best prepared as we would like to propagate across the nation and the world. Because if that was true, patients like Joshua might still be alive and be with us today. And so with that, I'll acknowledge Rob Knight. This is him sampling microbiome on a Komodo dragon at the zoo. He samples his children every day. And with that, I'll leave you with what we have left to do. So thank you. <laughs>